I'm delighted to be joined this morning by Dr. Marcus Goering, who's University Lecturer in Sustainable Development Law and International and European Law. And you teach uh, European Environmental Law and Sustainable Development. So Marcus, uh, could you define for me your field of expertise? Uh, what is it and why exactly does it matter? So uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, researching and teaching uh, European environmental and sustainable development law and have been for the last um, uh, 15 years. My main interest is uh, in looking at the regulation on the environment at the European and at the international level and to explore their interactions. So I'm also the course convener for the EU external relations course for that matter. Um, the field has been evolving. So it's a very new field um, uh, of law. We've have been discussing environmental protection issues really seriously at the international level since 1972 and sustainable development issues since 1992, the Rio Summit. And European law has really um, developed in tandem with the international level. Um, it used to be the case that a lot of innovations in environmental law came from the United States, which was the first country to adopt the Clean Air Act and to adopt various other statutes uh, on the protection of the environment. But in the last 15 to 20 years, that um, global leadership has actually changed. Nowadays, the most innovative instruments actually come from the European Union level, which is um, not very surprising because uh, in a way you're not um, developing these rules completely in a vacuum. There are countries within the European Union that have a long history of environmental protection. And these countries bring their best practices to the European level and then jointly uh, European Union countries decide to adopt these rules. Okay, so what has the EU's contribution been? What are some of the major impacts of EU policy in, in this field? Yeah, this is a really interesting development. Because, um, you know, sometimes the European Union is accused of being a really ideological uh, kind of project. But on the environmental law side, that is really not the case. Um, the, the first rules um, uh, at the European Union level developed out of a necessity. Because member states realized that if they wanted to protect... Um, say, uh, an animal, a bird species, or, or nature, or the environment in general, they couldn't do that without uh, a certain level of, of cooperation from, from their neighbours. So the first uh, directive was the birds directive, um, besides um, waste directives and, and more economically related directives, but the, the first real environmental directive was the birds directive because especially the Netherlands and the United Kingdom, uh, two nations that really value their, their, their bird life um, and, and have um, large groups of enthusiasts who, who go bird watching and, and really protect birds, realize that uh, some of the migratory birds weren't coming back. And that was due to very different levels of bird protection laws across the European Union. So the European uh, community at the time decided that they really needed common rules in order to reach the protection objectives that were uh, promoted in, in uh, countries like the Netherlands and the United Kingdom. Um, so it, they adopted this law on the basis of harmonization legislation and it's still one of the um, uh, most effective directives that we have um, for, the, for the protection of, of wild birds. It's been reissued um, a, a couple of times and um, it creates um, basically special 
bird protection zones so that migratory birds, uh, regardless of their, their, their flight routes, are no longer in danger of, for example, being hunted or, or um, faced with, with other uh, environmental challenges. Mm. So it comes from a realization that we're actually in Europe living in a, in a shared environmental space. We need the cooperation of other countries. And, and um, you know, a, a problem such as climate change uh, is, is, um, is, in effect, a shared environmental problem. So to have common rules um, at the European level makes good sense because um, at the same time we are operating in a, in a single market so we don't actually want, we do want a level playing field but that also means that if you have vastly different environmental protection laws you might actually put your own uh, economic sector at a disadvantage and that's also not the, the objective. So it's rather than thinking oh this is all ideological that we protect the environment it is actually it it makes your own rules much more much more efficient and and that's the the main impetus uh, the the main driver for eu environmental law in my view i suppose migratory birds and air quality don't respect national borders or the Schengen Agreement. <laughs> no, absolutely not, right? So uh, you, you, you will easily realize that um, the, if you want to achieve an environmental quality outcome and your neighbor really doesn't care or doesn't have similar approaches to the same problem, you will, you will get nowhere, right? And uh, we're, we're faced with this at the international level that we've come a much further way within the European continent. So what do you think that the impact of a Brexit, of a vote to leave, uh, would be in your field? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good uh, question. I don't think anyone has a decisive answer. I know, uh, as I had said on the previous point, that we need to co collaborate with our neighbours even as an island nation, we need uh, the the the, the buy-in, if you want, uh, from from other countries. So we need to cooperate with our, with our European neighbours um, if we want to achieve any uh, environmental protection outcomes. Of course, if we wanted to uh, leave the European Union and then get rid of all the environmental protection laws, uh, that would be uh, the the the. The only, the only possibility, uh, then probably our, all our neighbours would complain about uh, our own behaviour and that would lead to international uh, disputes. I think uh, realistically, uh, the, at, at least um, for the environmental field, uh, just like Norway, just like Switzerland, many of the far-reaching environmental um, directives and regulations such as the carbon emission trading directive or the REACH directive on chemicals will be um, will continue to be enforced and will be uh, updated and adopted uh, even post Brexit because um, those are also some of the laws that our neighborhood uh, cooperation partners in the east and uh, our North African partners uh, often subscribe to, right? So they will. Um, uh, so, in in other words, even if you are outside the European Union, uh, the thought that uh, you wouldn't have to comply with any of the environmental rules set by that body is, uh, in my view, completely illusionary. Um, rather, we would lose a lot of impact on the development of these rules. And there are often very, very technical pieces of legislation, right? So it matters whether um, you have uh, an exception for uh, an issue that you feel very strongly about in the fifth annex. But if you're not sitting around the negotiation table, it's very hard to get those kind of issues into 
the directive. Um, the Norwegians are on the receiving end, they're participating uh, to a large extent in the um, in internal market. So they oft often have to beg their Swedish, uh, Finnish and, and Danish uh, EU member state partners among the Nordic countries to please also bring the Norwegian issue to the table. I don't think that would be a very comfortable position for the United Kingdom to be in because I think um, the, the, the devil is often with these rules is, is in the detail. And if for lack of compliance with environmental rules, entire industries of the UK would be shut out of the in, internal market, I think that would be a miserable outcome. Okay. So there's almost negotiation by proxy in some circumstances. Exactly. So that's what my Norwegian friends tell me. It's very uncomfortable. Uh, yes, you're an independent nation. Yes, you care about environmental protection. But you're not really at the negotiation table and you're not there for the 11th hour when the last minute deals are made. And whether we like it or not, the EU is also about negotiation. It's about co collaboration with your European partners. And if you're just on the outside, you just, um, yeah, you're not part of that inner negotiation. So, is there one key sort of message or fact that you would like to be communicated more clearly as part of the uh, of the referendum debate in your field? Yeah, I think I think what is important is that the United Kingdom already has a lot of international obligations that we're not going to shared regardless whether the United Kingdom is a member state of the European Union or not. Um, but making this work in a way that is efficient and, 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 and really effective for environmental protection objectives um, is it, just easier and more straightforward um, if we are part of the European Union. Um, however, if your objective is to really scale down on environmental protection, uh, if you really don't care about the quality of, um, of your air or the quality of your drinking water, then um, yeah, you might vote in favour of uh, leaving the European Union. The, sometimes the argument is made, oh, if we, are, if we were not part of the European Union, we could have much stronger environmental laws. Well, there's a specialty in uh, EU law because uh, the environment is one of those fields where you can always have stronger environmental protection rules. So if you wanted much stronger uh, environmental protection rules in the United Kingdom, you could already do that under the EU treaties. I haven't seen the United Kingdom doing that uh, in the last uh, 25 years, so I wouldn't expect them to suddenly um, become the, the world champion on environmental protection laws outside the European Union. On the other hand, I've seen uh, the United Kingdom contributing in a very direct fashion to the development of EU environmental law. For example, the integrated, um, the IPPC directive, the Integrated Pollution and Prevention Control Directive, is a piece of legislation that was first trialled in the United Kingdom. This integrated thinking that you shouldn't move one area of, of pollution to another. So you shouldn't move air pollution to water pollution to ground soil pollution. Is, uh, is a direct um, uh, innovation that was introduced into uh, EU law by, um, by uh, the, the British negotiators. And I think, I think there are many more examples where Britain has actually been fantastic for um, environmental protection objectives all over the European Union. And I would hate to, to, to lose that kind of influence. Thank you very much for speaking to us today. Thank you.